we welcome everyone we are very hi. proud hi we are, we are we are very proud and uh, very happy to have uh, mr ajay thomas in our midst uh, it was a very happy day for us when he agreed to come to us uh, for a session and today is even happier day because he is here he is not uh, only very well known and a, a versatile writer he uh, a, a poet a fiction writer a translator and uh, famously uh, the editor of uh, indian literature of sai until Academy. recently <laughs> and <until, until> recently <laughs> <laughs> I left it after four years and five months. You know, the latest, so. and uh, and uh, that means that uh, such a varied experience uh, yeah. about Indian literature, and uh, twenty-three years, you know, twenty-three years in uh, in in the journal. So from all over India, I have a connection. Like I've seen this. <laughs> yes, <I> and... <laughs> confidently say what it is all about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so uh, we have a little plan that how we are going to do it. It's not that it's yeah. a very hard and fast rule that we have to follow exactly uh, uh, that the way. But anyway, but that, I'm that, going... that, that's fine. You know, the plan yeah. is fine. I think you know, it's good enough. Should 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 we mention it uh, to the audience, uh, or should we just go? Yeah, ahead? yeah just, just just say that you know, hmm. structured hmm. it that way so that you hmm. know the audience will know how much. and they have hmm. our discussion or that hmm. so this is our my uh, my introduction on behalf of uh, pune writers group and after that the opening remarks by the by the guest and after that there will be a, a poetry reading session and after that a little bit of discussion about uh, you know what we thought about uh, or what we felt about uh, those poems and then we are going to hear from him a translated short story and followed by a discussion and then a short story uh, written by him again discussion about that short story then poetry again and at the end we are going to have a uh, question answer sessions uh, uh, so when, when will you ask uh, your questions then? so your probably in, <laughs> yes in maybe in between sure. in, in between in between if we have time yeah that is uh, you know it's about <laughs> 15 minutes for a uh, you know uh, 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 uh the 15 minutes of uh, discussion after the first session of poetry hmm. and there is another 15 minutes uh, after the short story hmm. you can convert these and or in between you can put those two questions you know yes. in continuation of the go yes. so you I, yes. you you have to do that you have to <laughs> ask the questions and i'll ask yes yes now over to you let's let's begin yeah <laughs> Oh, uh, are we open? Uh, are you on? Uh, uh, are you on air now? Yes. Okay. Right. So, uh, everyone can see me, hear me. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I greet all the members of Pune Writers Group and my friends who have signed into this program. I thank Mr. Arun Parya for inviting me to this prestigious solo program, which is a great. honor for me personally and an acknowledgement of the importance of poetry and literature in general in such troubled times the generous allowance of 2 hours for this program exclusively involving me is a matter of pride for me and again a sign of the magnanimity of the organizers and the generosity of the audience who willingly spare such a long stretch of time keeping everything else away from their busy schedules for me writing and reading are intensely personal and private affairs unless it is a translation workshop for poetry or short fiction therefore what will writers do in a group maybe share their completed works or talk or discuss about other works that interest them indeed this is how works of art are made known to others film societies and appreciation clubs literary and art pages of publications social media at every level spread the word about works that have interested people in general and are deemed masterworks most of it is by word of mouth among friends and contacts sakrudayas or kunojis of 
or kindred souls or like-minded people or uh, birds of the same feather, or whatever the way you describe them, it is a congregation of hearts and souls. So I see this group this way. Though I have asserted at the beginning that writing and reading are intensely personal affairs for me, I believe that art should communicate. I do not take kindly to poets who write carefully constructed nonsense, or in other words, totally obtuse poems, adamant that the readers should not comprehend what it is. I'm saying this from personal experience. So there are people who, you know, write poetry uh, as a very personal kind of thing, and that doesn't serve any purpose. You know, there is a trend like that in modern poetry, yes. which is, I think, which doesn't serve any purpose. I think so, because uh, leaving it for posterity is one thing, fine. Uh, <laughs> hoping that, uh, you know, someone will, after 50 years, uh, discover this genius. But that is not the way it works, you know. Nowadays, it's, it's <laughs> everyone wants it now. So, writing across boundaries would mean writing in a globalized world as we have experienced intensely firsthand since the advent of the internet, but more specifically after web blogs or blogs were launched a quarter century ago. Social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and of late Instagram and similar platforms gave instant access to writing from any corner of the globe. More specifically, in our Indian context, where we have 24 national literatures as recognized by the National Academy of Letters, the Scythe Academy, and many hundreds more of other language and mother tongues, writing across boundaries have been going on for several centuries. Writing in English or Hindi is a sure way of getting across the boundaries, as they are almost lingua francas in large swathes of the Indian territory and across the globe. I'm now ready to share with you some of my poems a very short story and another story in my translation and if time permits a story of mine i will take part in the moderated discussions in between and also respond to your queries at the end thank you <clears throat> so now we'll go to the poetry section first reading do you share the poem yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read and I'll start reading and uh, uh, that's fine, you know, it, it, it's being recorded no, in any case, no problem. So this is how. This was published uh, recently in a web sign called uh, The Beacon. It's by Ashoka Bhattai. So he's uh, dedicatedly publishing poetry by uh, very well-known poets from across India. And not only poetry, uh, literature-related uh, thing. You can see that. You, you can see from my, I think I have sent you, I've sent you the, uh, let's see, you know, your WhatsApp messages. Uh, the link. I've right? sent you, yeah, the links the link right, of, of all, all of this. Yeah. So, uh, you see, I began writing poetry uh, uh, when I was uh, 23. 24, but often known like that. And, uh, uh, till I was about 35, I had only some, maybe some 30, 40. Can you, all of you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So, um, I brought out my first collection in 1989. And uh, let me just. So, after my first collection, Germination, came out in 1989, I wrote poetry over the next three, four years. And then there was a dry period that extended over 10 years. It was the middle of that period, that dry period of 10 years. I had been initiated into spiritual practices which changed the course of my life forever. About five years into it, poetry suddenly happened to me as the blessings of the Great Mother. Her many manifestations exploded in my consciousness and came out in this series. I have not looked back since. The series is titled Vada Vada Vagwadini. 
invocation of the muse. So the first poem in the series is Kameshwari. Your love, like the mother earth who takes in everything, like the sky that opens up and consumes all, sparkles my entire being. I'm spent. I have no dross left in me. I can't merely be grateful to you. I merge. I feel much more Kameshwari. The next poem in this series is You. You, like diluvian waters drowning the vermin, like diluvian fires burning away rakshasas, like tempests and storms blowing away dull mud. No need of any definition, all definitions meet in you. You are the golden key to the heaven's gate of poetry and love through which gales of fire rush down to the earth. Yes, your measure is the great mother, Paras, and she keeps you as her own. Your love is the next poem titled Your Love. Your love is the truth that blazes forth the sun above everything else. All germs perish in the fire that's hurled down. Your love is enveloping me, soft, light, and translucent, yet like burnished bronze turning me into a devi idol. You said your love is like flong and it's impossible to let it go. I see that in action. Set this father also free, only at the very end. Till then, hold me on the tight leash of your love. Dear child, you are my mother. The next poem is titled, The Storm's Past. The storm is past, the stars are out, the waves again back to their chant. You, the unfathomable ocean, once more calm. Yes, surge up to the shore as much as you want. Embrace it, roll over it, smoothen it out of all traces of everything and return spent. And come again when you will. The shore awaits your embrace as often as it can get. Excuse me. Yeah. I was just wondering, since we have the poet over here. Yeah. 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 What were you thinking of? What prompted you to write this? No, these are meditations. You know, when you are in meditation, there, okay. there will be there, there will be flashes like that. So it's not a kind of uh, crafted kind of uh, writing. It's uh, what do you say? Um, Extracted writing comes out of ecstasy. That's the kind of thing. Uh, the next poem is titled, I am a wide expanse. I am a wide expanse, pasture most green and lush. Forage on me, frolic on me, get absorbed in the silence of the open skies above, standing motionless on me. I won't deny you anything and myself don't seek anything. And yet your hyper presence thrills me from end to end. So there is a series, there are many like this in this train. So I will not read all of them. I'll just uh, uh, read a few. Write a poem on love is the next one, which is different from the other. A little write a poem on love and lock it away in another poem and then in another and another and another like you plant a seed covered in dry cow dung manure ashes and green leaves and wait for it to germinate sprout grow up and spread its branches let there be an ultimate poem that bursts out of all poems and fills the universe write a poem on love Post it in the sky. Let the wind take it. Let the rain soak it. Let the sun dry it. Let the earth receive it. So I'll read another kind of poem.
is titled Shurpanaka. You know who Shurpanaka is. This is uh, Shurpanaka from the uh, Athyatma Ramayana. It's not from the Vatmika Ramayana. In Athyatma Ramayana, Rama is the all knowing great spirit, you know, is God, Godhead. And he is all knowing. So he can't say that he doesn't realize what Shupana is all about. Shupana is deeply in love with him, with Rama. Shurpanaka. My enticing smile, alas, reveals only my fangs. My enamored fondling of your winsome shoulder are but scratches with my talons. My love burned eyes turn into two blazing embers. My bosom, a quiver with passion for you, reveal only my hirsute teeths. How am I to love you, Rama, with all these treacherous exteriors? My love for you is the yearning for the eternal you. But this is how I am defined. And you, of all people, spurn me? You are all seeing, aren't you? How come you can't see my heart burning in Panchagni, yearning for union with you? Your petite wife, whom you call half your body and soul, will soon turn fickle and jump out of the circle your slave brother has confined her in on your behalf. You can't spurn femininity and get away with it. I am Shurpanakha, the sole sister of the conqueror of heaven and earth, yet I fail in front of you, Rama. The molten lava of my tears will engulf you, your epic, in flames of devastation. So that is a short pranaka. Then I'll uh, read a poem that I wrote in Delhi over uh, eight, 13 years. So three part poem, it took 13 years to complete. The first part is 1995 to 2005. The first time I saw you in nine, November 95, shrouded in prickly mist, the street lamp's veiled glow of a demon's eyes, his horrid whiskers, the darkened trees, the bone chilling blast, his hellish breath, spewing carbon monoxide, soot, and SPM, poisoning my prana. I said, I'll never come to you if I can help it. And I boasted so to my friends. Still, you claim me as your own. Karmas dragging me here to expiate crimes of past Denmas. Yet I learned to love you. And I put up with your vagaries, your culture as fickle as your weather, the daily influx of impoverished hordes from all directions churning it. The hourly shifting cold depending on the snowfall in Himachal, the arid winds driving in the dust clouds from Rajputana for the Anthi. Now you suck me dry and wax in your glory, proud of your metro lines, high rises, shopping malls, world-class housing complexes, and hosting international events. Yet I don't forget you are the battlefield where parasites and fratricides thrive and still thrive. City of tombs and graveyards, are the budding flowers in your sprawling gardens, allurements to unsuspecting children? Do I hear the crunching of bones as you relish your glory repast? I wrote these lines about five years before Nitari happened. You know what happened in Nitari. So it is a kind of unexplainable uh, kind of uh, prophetic kind of lines like that. Yeah. Do you, I hear the crunching of bones as you relish your gory repast? Or has Mahakala chosen you as his instrument of dissolution? Here I am, perpetually in your ensnaring embrace. Even when your auto rickshaw drivers grab and pillage and revile me, I am eternally patient. I know I have to live out my karmas without rancor, impeccably. That is the first part. The second part is Delhi between 2005 and 2008. I recited the first part of this poem to an audience of elderly Delhi authors. 
Many of them expatriates from different corners of India. All of them, down to the last one, admonished me, pleaded with me, pitied me, saying that I missed out on the great Rajasik city that Delhi is, that one can accomplish anything here, that the Mahabharata war was possible only here, that the zest for life here is so vibrant, that once you get settled here, you cannot feel happy anywhere else, that this is a great Tapasa Bhumi where over thousands of years, rishis and yogis exist in ethereal form and in Bodhi as well, and where great saints like Nizamuddin Aulia are lying entombed. That one has to have accumulated many lives of Punya to be able to live in Delhi. That houses here need not observe the laws of Vastu, as every inch of the earth in Delhi is auspicious. The truth may lie somewhere in between. Indeed, Delhi to me is a place where one could do anything, but it's no one. It's not anyone's. One doesn't belong here. It's at once like an ocean that throws up everything it takes in and like a volcano that consumes anything thrown in. Now the third part of the poem, it is 2008 to 2010. That part I was in Libya. I was working, teaching in Libya, living there away from home. So away from Delhi, seven seasons now, she grows in me as a haunting presence. The glimpses I have of her in films like Delhi Six and the occasional news clips, the frequent talks with my wife and daughter about the city's almost palpable daily transformation put me in a state of yearning. Strange indeed, I find that I have been loving Delhi all along. And now I have finally recognized my love. But this has changed again, of course, coming back and I ran away from Delhi in uh, June this year, came back home. I haven't returned yet. So, so this is my Delhi poem. I had a question about this. Since you've written mm -hmm. it over a long period of time, yeah, yeah. are you really happy with it? Or would you still want to modify it? And how do you modify your poem? No, I, I, I think I'll, I'll stop it here because this is compact enough. Otherwise, it'll go on and on. I'll be writing maybe, uh, see, I have made a presentation uh, in the Poetry um, uh, Poetry Society of India and the Indian International Center about uh, uh, one and a half hour presentation mm -hmm. in which I, you know, uh, my memories of the city, I, I presented in between some 12, 13 poems uh, about Delhi, which I read out. And uh, then I thought, you know, it's, uh, there can be a long, narrative kind of, uh, uh, you know, ambitious kind of uh, narrative poem, almost an epic on Delhi. So that's, I'm not modest about these things. I'm just bragging. So I may write that. So let this be this. You know, this is a compact experience. I may write a lot of poems, and more poems, like many more things have happened uh, after uh, 2010. So the last 10 years, uh, Delhi has... <laughs> just undergone a lot more changes and seen many things happening. So that's, it may go on. Yeah. Do you want more poems or uh, are you asking questions or how? Arun, uh, what do you think about this? Uh, well, before that, probably I will open uh, this one to the audience yeah. that would you like yeah. to read more poems? Yeah. Would you like to discuss the poems that? Yeah, um, yeah that will be very. Book, yeah, there's something great. Yeah, that will be uh, good. Yes. Yeah. Garima Rai says a few more poems, please. Okay. Okay, Garima, I'll read. Uh, now that I've read on Delhi, I will continue uh, two, three on Delhi and we'll wrap it up around Delhi. So the first one is titled The Dogs of Ajitgar. Ajitgar is uh, the mutiny memorial. It's the mutiny memorial in the colonial times. It is the Gothic tower built on the northern ridge visible from this Tisasari metro station and joining the Delhi University North Campus to commemorate the 3,000 odd English officers and men who were killed in suppressing the first war of independence in 1857. During the mutiny, as it was called, hundreds of thousands of the residents of the city and the rebel soldiers were killed. 
The mutiny memorial stands at a point a few meters uphill from the Bada Hindu Rao Hospital, which was formerly known as Fraser House. This site, which served as the command center for forces connected to the slaughter of several hundreds of thousands of Delhiites in two episodes, five centuries apart. This is a spot where Timur encamped and oversaw the slaughter of more than 100,000 Delhiites over three days and nights in 1399. Also feature in persistent ghost stories narrated by famed local rack <laughs> Some cross talk has come in. Terribly sorry about that. Yeah, Terribly yeah. sorry. Also, Nadir Shah. Nadir Shah's, but that's not this spot. This spot is Timur's and the company uh, military's headquarters. So, this is one that particular spot. You know, in the City of Jinns by uh, our uh, William Dalrymple. This, this both these episodes are uh, explained. So for those who are interested in history, you can just go refer to that book. So this site, uh, yeah, this place also feature in persistent ghost stories narrated by famous local raconteurs like Darby Smith, who passed away recently. The Mutiny Memorial was renamed Ajitgar, or the site of the unvanquished by the central government on the 25th anniversary of Indian independence in 1972, and a new plaque was installed, explaining that the enemy mentioned in the original inscription by the British at the site are the freedom fighters and martyrs of India who fought bravely against the repressive colonial rule in the first war of independence. I, along with my daughter and my niece, visited Ajitgar and other nearby monuments in July 2016. So the visit inspired the poem. So the poem, The Dogs of Ajitka. Crushing a rebellion is the bounden duty of all power centers. All the blood of the warriors of the first war of independence was built, this mutiny memorial to celebrate the company's dead. A mid-July afternoon, post-lunch inertia ridden, we trundled up the ridge road the air dripping humid beneath the thick summer green. We swim up, breathing through our mouths. Climbing up the base, we hardly make a round on the plinth when deep growls from the dark recess stop us. Several pairs of glowing eyes flash. The first one stalks out menacingly, blocking our path, followed by another then another, a couple more, in a convex arc formation. Loath to brook history's twist. Ajitgar. The next Delhi poem is Sarmad Shaheed. So, quite a few uh, months, a couple of years later, that is, I revisited the Juma Masjid area in Balimaran some time ago, which inspired two poems. First one is on the martyr Sarmad, who was executed by Emperor Aurangzeb. Sarmad Shahir. The king is naked, cried the innocent child. Power is naked, the unsheathed sword. Truth is naked too. Innocence can see it. The two often clash in battle, sparks flying. Sticking to nudity is the ultimate truth speaking. That is what Sarmat did, the absolute unconformity outside the frames of the established. If Mansur al Halaj declared, I am the truth, chanting an al Haq, Sarmat did something similar, saying only the la ilaha part of the kalima, leaving out the illa Allah, perhaps implying there is no God outside but within oneself. Dazed by the unraveling, Aurangzeb had him beheaded outside the eastern gate of Juma Masjid, where the headless Sarmad danced on the steps, carrying his head in his hands before giving up the ghost, as the legend goes. Standing on the very steps, I frame a picture of his red dargah below with a Kila Amola or the exalted fortress, which was eventually reduced to the simple Lal Kila 
to suit the latter day reality of total decrepitude looming in the skyline behind. So the third poem in that section is Galip's Haveli in Balimaran Road. The timeless poet shares his home now with a shock. Never mind, faring better than many of Delhi's beloved bards who upheld the Ganga Jamni Tuxi and yet have left no earthly trace. One can only gaze around at the relics of his life with the lump rising to one's throat. Such exalted conceits, wordcraft, humor, unbending sense of honor bruised by history's nasty turns, perpetually in debt yet never perturbed in his angelic self. Homeless, ever roaming in spirit, he would have little value for a majestic dwelling place like this. He had even forgave the garish facelift given to this long-lived-in one-time quarters. He knows these and the countless tomes churned out about him are well-meaning attempts to keep his memory alive. He would even forgive this my lame verse in his name. So, more poems? So now, uh, probably... We just uh, shift to the next section, and before okay. that, maybe we ask yeah. uh, we ask you uh, take this opportunity to ask you a few questions. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, uh, of course, the question uh, the, the, these questions are not going to be related to the poems that you have read, yeah. Yeah. but uh, you know, because of your vast experiences, we thought that we would like to yeah. ask a few general you know, general questions. Um, okay, right. Ours is a community of writers. Yeah. And uh, you know, if you ask us, you know, we 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 pursue to write well. Yeah. But the question here is that you know, what is good writing? What is writing well? <laughs> and uh, how one understands that if she's a good writer, mm -hmm. how to become a good writer? And uh, or is it all subjective, uh, depending on the mood of the day? Today, because I'm being appreciated, so I'm a good writer, and tomorrow I'm not. <laughs> and uh, you know, as love given by the readers. See, for commenting on good writing, one has to fall back on one of the traditional definitions of literature. You know, literature in all handbooks or uh, about uh, literature, defining literature, you'll come across this. Literature is a writing that is capable of moving minds and hearts. Good writing is exactly the same as this, see? I do not know how one becomes a good writer. Anyone with a flair for writing can become a writer. Anyone whose writing moves the readers is a good writer. One who can write drawing on one's own resources and also on the traditional knowledge handed down and following one's own perceptions and epiphanies may become a writer whom the readers may cherish. Any creative writing is subjective, I believe. It's not merely knowledge production compiling of information and collection of data. It is intended to give the readers a supreme aesthetic experience. A sharing of the inner world or the subjectivity of the writer. Mode of the day may not at all affect a seasoned writer or even the love and support given by the readers because any good writer utterly alone at the moment of creation will not look for any support or any 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 encouragement or anything you know it, it, it's like a rishi or muni you know like lost in that uh, uh, world of uh, sarga srishti you know that's a creation so it's a full time intense activity for its own sake. So I can't define it better. <laughs> one can engage in creation or advance on the blank page only by herself or himself. No one can encourage a writer. So it is hard to know whether I'm writing well or not. Right? No, you whether can, I'm... you know, you can write, you can send it to an editor, for example, or show friends in the same kind of group, maybe if it moves. But you will yourself know if you're writing something good, you will know that it's good enough. And they will send it to an editor. Uh, 
yeah we'll come to that you know the next question <laughs> it's coming to yeah yeah so of course the next question uh, you know the next question is uh, you have mentioned a little bit about yourself yeah so the question is that of course many of us uh, we hold this ambition to be a versatile writer uh, we don't uh, we, we just don't uh, wish to be a poet or don't wish to only be a novelist or a children's writer we wish to be everything and uh, now you yourself is a versatile writer so please tell us a little bit about yourself that how how was your literary journey and how you could become that and uh, what happened on those days you know initial the days when probably um, um, because we are we are full of self doubt uh, and, yeah. and sometimes we are very you know excited so uh, you see uh, the, i yes. began as i said i began writing uh, uh, in uh, uh, 1973 4 you know that was the time i was working uh, in a bishop's house i was the private secretary to a bishop of manandawadi and luckily this man was a, a literature buff himself and had done his ma in literature from kodam university in new york and uh, uh, returned with a lot of books <laughs> which i i we i swindled one book uh, <laughs> the english romantic writers a big tomy this this tome i even now have you know it's about i write the roman I, i like the romantics very much so i was just saying I, that was around the time i began writing seriously then a lot of that uh, bishop was a very supportive person he told me he gave me enough confidence you know, he read through and he's a literature man so he made some uh, the, the first poem i wrote a serious poem i wrote he he touched up here and there and he said it's excellent very good so that gave me an immense kind of confidence at the time you know i was only 19 20 so that kind of a, a, a start then i took up uh, after the uh, uh, wynard episode i was in wynard for two years with the bishop and i joined in the kerala tourism development corporation service in uh, takedi periyar tiger reserve you know the arunani was the I used to meet a lot of writers, you know, all these big writers, you know, Sir Angus Wilson, Dominique Lapierre, our own Salman Rushdie in his very earliest form before writing the, yeah, about the time he wrote The Midnight's Children. You know, that, you know, so, uh, and Pridish Nandi, Pridish Nandi used to come and say they were open and he used to read his poems and we used to read poems together, compare and all that. But... you know sending i sent a few to the mirror at the time the illustrated weekly and kamla das i think was the poetry editor didn't publish any and uh, yeah i i did not think much about it i went on writing you know then uh, sending uh, poems to indian literature can happen very much later on because uh, by the time i sent uh, my poems it was sachidanandan k sachidanandan was the uh, editor it was in 93 but before that i had a lot of experience you know uh, interactions with the uh, leading writers of the day paul sakarya you know paul sakarya is my personal friend and uh, so i i was in between uh, uh, my job in ktdc i had uh, gone to do a full time and fill and later phd the school of letters where you are ananda muthi had set up a school of letters in kottayam the university so that gave me the kind of uh, exposure to the kind of one huge field of activity which i didn't mention when you mention that i am a versatile writer you can say that i am a versatile translator <laughs> so that is what i have done uh, the voluminous kind of work i have done is translation and my own writing was going on so my first collection came out in 1989 in between and after that uh my mphil dissertation was a uh, actual translation of 17 malayalam short stories and a long study so i got into the the translation of fiction till then i was translating only poetry then paul sakarya's short stories in 93 then it came about you know all all big ones you know the when we group you know the and bidawadi so his uh, masterworks 
all that uh, happened in between and i i got all my awards for translation including the crossword award that was uh, 2007 i came to mumbai for that uh, meeting a lot of people uh, you know being in the academy was much later in 97 only 97 i joined the bar academy before that i had won an award and gone around the world for four months you usa uk europe and all that so writing has brought me all these things and uh, i don't think i have given enough dedicated enough time to writing now i'll be i think uh, doing that because uh, running a journal like in the literature is uh, really you know it takes a lot of time two months and you have to bring out 225 pages and of late i didn't have anyone else you know i was doing even including the proofing so the whole kind of thing you know things are becoming difficult you know so you come to know in later uh, this thing it's, it's not easy now in the public domain but indian literature is the only one now uh, which can carry uh, uh, prospective uh, poets and uh, uh, fiction short fiction writers uh, works so mine has been a journey like this up and down uh, hop skip and jump kind of thing uh, now i have all this i haven't you know when i am when i am with indian literature i didn't really want to ask any of these publishers to publish my poem because you know it doesn't look nice so i have, i don't want to name people but many two three four people have been asking me for free houses and friends have been asking me to send my manuscript but now as years you know roll by i couldn't do that now that i'm free of all these things i will now that my big collection is just on the way yeah so i'm just going to send uh, uh kind of uh, my writing uh full time writing phase has begun only now <laughs> yeah translation i'm uh, bringing out uh the greatest malayalam stories ever told that's why uh, i live because they, they, that's a series that's coming out you know the greatest indian stories ever told is a series now uh, stories from uh, urdu bangla and odia i want to come out there are all some 20 22 25 uh, stories but mine is 75 you see it's a it's a volume that holds the best of malayalam short stories over the last century so that's almost complete and uh, hopefully come out in june 2021 that is a uh, one thing and other projects are on these are all translation compilation all that you know so that i have these are commitments that i have made so i'm taking all this along parallelly and uh, writing my poems and uh, publishing uh, now that i can i'm, I'm out of indian literature i can publish in indian literature as <laughs> <laughs> the next the next uh, editor so i sent uh, some poems to indian literature without any delay <laughs> yeah. many of many of us uh, many of us uh, yeah. have this ambition to yeah. get published in, in indian literature that would be the yeah, kind of a you can send you know you can send and see send them to the i'll give you the email id you can just uh, say the antara devsen is new editor oh yeah. oh so yeah she has been uh, running uh, the little magazine yeah the little magazine yeah. yes yes so uh, she's Uh, for the last uh, six years, he's not uh, able to bring out the magazine for various reasons. Mm. Now she is the editor of Indian Literature. She's a friend, so <laughs> like that, you know, it's like that. Yeah. There is one question. Probably it's a little yeah. related because uh, yeah. you're talking about translation. Uh, yeah. It is from uh, Mr. Shukumar Dash. Mr. Mm-hmm. Dash, would you like to uh, ask the question? Mr. Dash, are you there? Could you hear us? Maybe he did not 
Okay, so can, I, yeah. yeah, probably I'm going to I'm going to uh, read. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so Malga, yeah. Ask me. One second. One second, sir. Yeah. yeah. Sir, can you, yeah. can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Thank you for inviting me to the meeting. Yeah. Sir, uh, considering considering that uh, writing is a very difficult task. What would you... Task. Which... It's not a task. It's a passion. Yeah. It, it's, it's, a, it's a passion. Yeah. It, it's a passion, a pleasure. Yeah. Still, still, then, still then, which one would you consider to be more uh, difficult to perform that is Original writing or translation, sir? I'll, without any hesitation, say that translation is more difficult because I have okay, uh, you, multi, like, multi, multiple responsibilities and I have to be faithful to the original. Sir, sir you, you, are, have, you are the only person available before me yeah. who, can, who, can, who can rather rather uh, guide this way. Yeah. So, sir, thank you, sir. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm there, sir. I'm listening to you, all of you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any 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 anyone anyone uh, who would like to comment on the on the poems or the questions? So. I'm just wondering. You've been reading poems for the of the last hundred years and translating them. Have you been seeing yourself growing tremendously while you're translating? I'm sure you have. I mean, but uh, how has this journey been? Reading, translating, and you, your experience as a uh, poet yourself. Yeah, the this is the, what the, over the last uh, the, the, uh, the the project I mentioned is the short stories, okay. Malayalam, the greatest Malayalam stories during the last century for 100 years, which I am. Uh, uh, bringing out in a volume called The Greatest Malayalam Story, I was told you know, that's the series name for Ali. It's not the, uh, the, the poetry that I mentioned, it's only a particular project about okay. translating the short stories, the greatest stories of Malayalam uh, over the last hundred years into English. To your question as to whether I uh, find it uh, difficult. Uh, in when translating poems and writing my own at the same time, it is it, it, two different activities. So uh, translation is like, you know, it is uh, what to say, you are always translating uh, work you love or you, you are one with. So you are recreating that work into the language you translate into the target language. So, about poetry particularly, this is true. But you have, uh, you know, you have what you have uh, constraint. You have to be faithful to the original. You have to carry the sense of the original into the translated version, especially from Malayalam to English. It's very difficult that way. But uh, translating poetry is a challenge, really, because again, you have to depend on your deep sense of the words that you choose. Any kind of, uh, you can't choose a word uh, uh, lackadaisically. You know, like, say, uh, there may be a, a hundred different, uh, uh, you know, synonyms for a word with different shades of meaning. You have to write, choose the right word with the right shade of meaning and the context. So that is it's quite a uh, you know task. So that is something else. But you write your own poetry when uh, in, in 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 a particular uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, vision kind of thing that you get. You know you you start writing on a. So it's a totally different activity. The translation is a set, planned, deliberate act. It, it's not it's not right. But poetry writing is not deliberate. You know it's it's. it's you, it's not even a mood. You can't uh, diminish it into a, or reduce it to a, a, a word called mood. It's not a mood. It is something, you know, it is the time when you 
you and you can share your you know your kind of uh, deepest kind of uh, sensations writing down it, it's not about lyric poetry alone it's about a kind of philosophic visionary kind of thing that you feel like i said uh, earlier you know during meditation during sleep you know half sleep uh, wakeful kind of thing you get a flash then you write and it will just tumble down that is the way i write poetry so these are two different activities that way does that answer your question yes please thank you yeah. Yeah. i think yeah. we have a question by gadima yeah Yes, Garima. Hello, sir. Yeah, how are you? I'm doing good, sir. Yeah. Uh, you left Delhi, so. Yeah, I left Delhi. Yes, I left Delhi in June. Ah, uh, so my. You 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 still in uh, Satyavati College? I've changed. I've changed to uh, Shama Prasad West uh -huh. Delhi. It's a okay. girls' college. Yeah. So, yeah. I have my question in two yeah. parts. Yeah. one is with reference to your use of the word i mean mm. generally asking mm -hmm. what prompts you to use words like uh, phrases like fish thorn rather than right. say the common ordinary fish bone which one would normally <laughs> go to it's your original poem it's not a translation right yeah And, i'm taking that i'm i'm, I'm taking that uh, liberty to coin that word you know it's it's called in malayalam it is fish thorn literally oh. so to bring about that uh, effect of how your uh, finger will be you know uh, when pierced by the uh, fish bone mm -hmm. how it is like your your hand is pierced by a thorn you know that the experience is that bone we have to explain that the bone is acute or uh, pointed or uh, like mm. that but the thorn you know it's, it's by definition it is sharp and acute so <laughs> so i created that uh, thing i took that liberty that's fine i think mm. i'm sure there must be other such constructions also in other works yeah the, 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 those those things the, the, those are also not not deliberate uh, uh, the things that come you know those those things happen at the time and i mm. do that yeah Yeah. and also your the second uh, question is since you have this uh, you are more given to the fact that uh, translation or even poetry should be something which you get as a flash or which should be more organic or natural yes Come translation about translation i don't say that about translation i say that it is a very deliberate act you choose a poem because you love it you know that your uh, passion about that Uh, begins and ends there but once you begin translating you are trying to be uh, uh, you you create something in the target language with the kind of restrictions that the original imposes on you but uh, translation of poetry is also to a measure uh, inspired in that you know you getting the right word you know that mm. uh, only with inspiration you get yeah that relation But of writing writing your own poems is uh, like i said earlier it's entirely different that is when you have a meditation uh, or an, a, a vision or a flash kind of thing you 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 get that kind of a, an insight and uh, then you hold on to that experience that uh, that, mm. that gives you uh, then you develop you know then you develop that Uh, into but you have to work on it like yes develop work, 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 work on it is not even uh, uh, it's not that uh, it's not uh, equal to your translation no this is you know you sit down and without breaking or without any kind of disruption you remember the coldred story mm. it's about writing kubla khan We yeah. had he Got had the entire poem in yeah in a reverie. So that's an extreme case. Even otherwise, poets who write uh, that kind of poems. There are also poets who write deliberate poems. Uh, like I said earlier, there are you know all kinds of poets that uh, and all kinds of poetry also. But mainly, poetry is not a logical kind of uh, activity. It mm. is more of a uh inspiration based or perception based activity so mm. th that's the difference 
and Can in translation you? yes yeah. i i think i get what you're saying yeah 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 and in translation uh, i do translate a few uh, yeah. short stories so i have noticed in my case you i translate from nepali or uh, you yes, translate from hindi yeah yeah. But the assignments, formal ones, which have been published in the form of book are from English to Nepali. <laughs> okay, English to Nepali. Okay. Yeah, so, right. but otherwise I do from Nepali to English. So, mm -hmm. I've noticed that if you keep the work and then yeah. revisit after some time, yeah, everything settles down and you get a better yeah. perspective. Yeah, uh, that's true. What to edit out and how to rephrase yeah. something. That, 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 that's the second phase, you know. The first phase uh -huh. is when you finish the work. Then you start working, reworking, polishing. That is the craft part. You know, that, that mm -hmm. you have to do, yes. It's like a carpenter, you know, puts together, uh, you know, the chisel wood and you make a frame of a, mm -hmm. a chair, for example. But the finishing work, that is all, everything. Though you have a frame, you'll not mm -hmm. be able to use it as a chair unless and until you finish the work. So that kind of thing is there for everything. That is the way I, I, can, I can say, the, the, that's the nearest I can say. Mm. So probably, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, tell me. There was one more, I don't know if I'm taking too much yeah, yeah. time. Not at all, you just you have enough time. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, in relation to uh, uh, what I enjoy reading yeah. as literature or what I conceive as yeah. a good uh, style. Yeah. Uh, the relation between, say, real events like history and literature uh -huh. what happens when the literary narrative is also presenting history in a kind of you know yeah it, of course in the form of fiction but it has yeah. more force than pure history yes yes true and if you could think of any work that has stayed with you and which you would like to I mean, are there any references that you feel? You see, uh, the uh, I've read only the translation, you know, the uh, Gana Devada by Tara Shankar Banerjee or uh, Koyar by Takari Shiva Shankar Okay, okay. Both these are based on the history, uh, you know, uh, of, of a particular time. Mm -hmm. In, in Bengal and in Kerala's uh, mm -hmm. Kutanar, the central uh, area. You see, everything, uh, the, 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 both the novels are historical in that sense. Yes. But, but how you treat, you know, how human beings are playing their yes. parts in that historical saga. So that mm -hmm. is the, that drama is the action part of the novel. You know? So that, there are so many, I'm just saying one, and you mm -hmm. just look at Amidav Ghosh. All mm -hmm. his novels are historical, you know, yes. history, recreating history, you know, fantastic movie, you know, it's, it's too much of history than fiction is his problem. <laughs> but even then, it's so many, you know, there are so many, most of these people writing, are, uh, you know, novels of uh, fiction, they're all history-related, history historical, you know. It has. It is more powerful, and I feel more powerful. Yes, at many levels. Yeah. And mm -hmm. also, imagination has its own. You know, in science fiction, mm -hmm. uh, for example, or futuristic writing, they also have their own. You know, look at 1984. Mm -hmm. What we thought was a mere kind of uh, conjecture, uh, yeah, figment of imagination, has now come to pass really? in real life in our country, right now, 1984. Mm -hmm. So. This is the way it is. So. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, please Thank say you. hello to your dad when you call Sure, him. sure. Just he he always going. regards that you have a great command over <laughs> language. And he, I mean, long, long ago, They're from long friends. time ago, he always is yeah. appreciative of your language and yeah. your editorials. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you. sir. Thank, Thank you. So probably this is the yeah. time to uh, go to that translated story how, how uh, this, uh, this, uh, there are two stories in fact two uh, short stories one is uh, one is about uh, december it's titled december uh, but it's it, about has it, it been it, published no no it's not no. mine it, it, it's by uh, 
writer, a celebrated young writer called Umni R. Uh, this is written around the time of uh, the Shaheen Bagh incident and all that. You know that it, it's the CA protests and all that. It was happening. So this story is it's like a poem. Really, it's very short. It's only one paragraph. It's titled December. Only are. Oh my lazy child, please get up and see the sunrise. His umma would tell him every morning. Uma is a, a Muslim word for mother in Malayalam. When Umma's voice opened the door and entered, he would lie in the darkness and his blanket like a speck of the sky untouched by light, giving Umma the sleep. The dog, cat and the trees near the neighboring house would stand around stealthily and call him, Oh, you lazy child. Each day, Uma, the breeze, the cat, and the trees, thinking that he would rise early that day to see the sun rising, would sit for going sleep, waiting for the lazy child to wake up early and to come out from under the blanket. But the lazy child slept on, snoring, giving the sleep to everyone. One day, before Uma, the cat, and the trees woke up from sleep, and he brushed off sleep and rose from under the blanket. He opened the door without making any noise. Today the sun would come out cheerfully from the border of the sky to see me, he thought happily. He stood waiting for the sun to touch his tender bare body, feeling the chill of the cold that enveloped him. As his, as his eyes walked through the mist of far to see the sun, the instant it rose, his ear, which was accustomed to hearing only soft voices, was terrified by a sound that came suddenly. When the sound rang in his ears again and again, he screamed. Hearing his scream, the house sprang awake. As Umma came running, finding him with terror-stricken eyes, she cuddled him close. He asked her, Umma, did I wake up late? Was this the right time for me to get up? Uma stood staring into the darkness that slowly rose without uttering a word. That is the end of the story. Hello. So that is the it's, end of the story. Be, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is, it's, a, it's a poem. It's yeah, a yeah. prose poem kind of thing. Yeah. So what will be the the delicateness the yeah, 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 yeah. yeah very 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 deep yeah. but this is the mood this is what we are where we are lazy sleepers yeah. so the version you read was translated uh, by another this is a story by unni r he is a, a very uh, the most, uh, you know, belongs to the uh, the generation that came after uh, uh, Paul Sakarya and all that. And uh, now these are the leading uh, 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 story writers like Subhash Chandran, mm -hmm. Uniya, so many of them. So this is a uh, story which is. Uh, very, very short story. This was published in uh, the Indian Express about uh, last uh, 2020, January. Yeah. Now, what will you do? Would you like to read a, a story translated by you? Um, is, is there any? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a story I translated with I, which you which you heard right now. Oh, right, right now. The, the, oh, yeah, oh, okay. this is this is a story that I translated. Yeah. Right now, what I read December is a story that I translated of Unni Oh, okay. Yeah, if you want, I can read another short story. Very uh, one thousand words. So, nice. Yeah, this is by S K Potekar. S K Potekar is the Nanpi Dawadi before Takadishi Vishnu. Escape Potekar is a 
he is known for his travel writing. He is a pioneering uh, travel writer in Malayalam. He is the one who inspired Paul Sakari also to write uh, travel books. And it says he is a, he's a genius in that you know, travel writing and fiction. Fiction. This is the kind of fiction he is. So this is a, a very small story. Uh, it's titled On the River Bank Escape or Take Out. A small river snakes its way at the base of a rounded hill shaped like a sago palm flower head. You know sago palm? Sago palm flower. The river bank is almost hidden with the low overhanging branches of old gnarled trees, the thickets of stunned nut formica trees, and creepers intertwined. Horrid daytime darkness lay hugging the area. Nearby, in the middle of the river, is a deep pool. There is a rock that lies partially submerged in the pool. Old timers call it Talavatipara, or the beheading rock. It is believed that criminals were beheaded on this rock. No one bathes there. The water has a different color near the rock. Close to where the hill begins, there is a stunned sago palm raising its head over the ground. On its apex, there is a flower head like a blazing flame. The intoxicating fragrance from it wafts in the air all around. Near the sago palm, there is a Barbados nut tree, half of it withered and the other half distorted as if paralyzed. On one of its branches, five or six bundles wrapped in old screw pine mats dangle, which can be seen reflected in the sediment covered river water's surface at that point. Those are the placentas of cows and goats which have been packed and hung there. Close to that, the fat red taproot of some tree made naked by the soil at its base, having flown away or eroded. Around the slanting polakali tree that's bereft of all its leaves and looks like a dead horse's ribcage bones, some wild aloe vera plants stand like swaying snakes with their hoods open. From somewhere inside the thicket, a gigantic angeli tree is an Atrocapus hirsuta, you know, angeli, you know with, with leaves and uh, very tasty. It's like a small jackfruit, but it's called uh, angeli, Atrocapus hirsuta. Angeli tree stands straight, touching the sky. An almost dry brook joins the river below the pool. It is a tiny ford at this point. Midday, the sand on the river bank turns scorching in the fire-like sun of Kanyi. Kanyi is, you know, after the onam season. Mathaviyamma bathed her son, dried him off, brushed his hair with her fingers, polished his face, made him wear the silk konakam, and konakam is the, the um, loin cloth, and sent him off to the river bank. That six-year-old boy, like an obedient child, sat on the rock in the shade of a teak tree, stretching his legs out. Five minutes passed. All of his limbs began to move intermittently. Childhood is a drop of mercury. No one can keep it stationary. The boy's wide eyes flitted here and there without resting anywhere. He began to count his fingers to find out if all 10 of them were there. He measured the length of his brow, his chin and his nose using his index finger. Then he blocked one of his nostrils with a finger and started humming, letting his breath out through the other, tapping the openly like uh, tapping the opening lightly in rhythm. For some time, he played the fiddle in that fashion. Then he stopped it. He pressed his upper eyelids down with his pointing finger, looked all around the trees and brushes, bushes, and saw the distorted sight of them becoming double, and he felt exhilarated. Suddenly, an idea flashed in his mind. Mother, may I build a dam across the brook and play? No, no, don't play in the mud, Uni. Sit still there. See, don't lose that ring. Uni's face turned skewed. 
he took the ring that he had placed on his thigh, a gold ring studded with a red stone. The mother had entrusted it with him to take care of it until she bathed and returned from the river. He tried the ring on all of his fingers. Finally, he fixed it on the thumb of his right hand. Then he shut his eyes tight, crossed his hands on his chest and sat without knowing what else to do. He opened his eyes and tried to touch his nose with the tip of his tongue. Then he filled his mouth with air and hissed like a snake. Thus, he was trying out several tricks. Now this place is in the sun. May I move over to the clump of bamboos and sit in the shade, Mother? Hmm, Mother Vyama hummed, lost in some reverie. Imitating the walk of a lame person, he walked over to the bamboo clump. Thus, he escaped his mother's direct vision. The brook was passing next to that bamboo clump. In it, in a puddle, the image of the midday sun was blazing. A dragonfly was frolicking there, rising suddenly in the air above the water's surface, diving quickly, touching the water, then rising again, hovering. It attracted Uni's eyes. Turning his neck towards it, looking at it sideways, he rose gradually. It was a pretty dragonfly wearing a red thong like his. He knew a trick catching the dragonfly and making it carry tiny stones clutched in its legs. As he advanced two steps, the dragonfly stopped its water spots and flying across his face, alighted on a Nokinia shrub. He stretched out his right hand and forming his thumb and forefinger into a shape of a pair of pliers, stalked it selfly to the Cochinia shrub. Just as he reached near, the dragonfly flew away. Without halting anywhere near, it flashed towards the east. Uni didn't give up. Resolute, he went in search of it. He detected it rising from a lantern shrub. He crept inside the thicket. As he stretched his hands towards the dragonfly, it rose from the clear road in Rund leaf where it was sitting and flitted across and perched on the Barbados nut bush. Presently, it slipped away and descended on the aloe vera leaf and alighted tenuously as if it was doing a prostration. Cursing the waywardness of the dragonfly, Unni, without lowering his raised hand, bit his lips, blinked his mischievous eyes, opened his mouth and waited quietly for the dragonfly to come out, come to a complete rest. But it rose and again settled on the Barbados nut bush with its wings flat. The midday sun's rays penetrated through the porous foliage of the Angeli tree, drawing a chiaroscuro of circles of light on the ground. The sago flower, the skeletal ribcage of the Pulakali tree, and the matte bundles on the Barbados nut tree showed themselves distinctly in that light. There was a movement from a hole in the ground at the base of the Angeli tree. The dry leaves lying about moved and a rustling sound arose. A king cobra came out, circled itself around the base of the rough peeling skin of the tree bowl and crawled over to the other side. The dragonfly had settled down in full rest mode on the branch of the Barbados nut tree, stretching towards the sago palm, palm flower. Only his tender hands were inching towards it. His Divatma and Paramatma were stuck on that branch. The dragonfly's red tail was the only thing he could see in the whole world now. The sunshine, like poured down molten silver, fell on his fingers. Seeing the red stone studded on the ring on Unni's finger, from behind the sago palm flower, two tiny eyes like red glass hoops shone. The snake had raised its head, drawing in the fragrance of the sago palm flower. The shining red stone on the ring attracted the attention of the snake. It raised its head further, flashed its eyes, drew air into its body, shook and inflated itself, and stood with its hood spread. The dragonfly does not flinch. Only his hands have been lowered and are moving forward almost imperceptibly. Suddenly, the dragonfly moves a little from its perch, 
bathes its wings and overs up a little, makes small circles and settles back in its previous spot. It seems that it is reluctant to move away from the circle of the midday sunshine. The king cobra is standing immobile, staring at the shining stone on the ring. The tender fingers of Uni's hands, formed like the head of pliers, stand still as it's stuck in the air. Uni's fingers begin to make the minutest movements. This time, it is not directed toward the target fly, but in a, in a childish shift of strategy through a maneuver from the right. Uni's hands keep moving towards the right, towards the serpent's mouth. Following the tiniest movements of Uni's fingers and following the resulting shift in sheen of the stone and ring, the serpent keeps turning its hood around in its standing position. As, at, as that point of red light advances further and further, the serpent keeps withdrawing its hood back as if poised for a sudden strike. The dragonfly is dozing off in the intoxication of the sunshine. Those fingers nearing the dragonfly are reducing the space between them and the fly to that of a mustard seed size. A moment frozen. Uni closes in with his fingers like the lids of an eye shutting. The dragonfly's tail is now in their grip. The instant the dragonfly beats its wings and squirms, Uni twists his body once like a lightning streak, lets out a shout, and races across the riverbank, disappearing from sight. Perplexed, the king cobra turns around in all four directions like a rubber doll. Then, as if having lost face, it slowly shrinks its hood, turns its head, crawls on the ground, flips its forked tongue, smells the screw pine bundle on the Barbados nut tree, turns its red once again, moves forward, coils around once on the bare tree root, then moving along the base of the Kulakali tree and among the wild aloe vera plants, it slithers on its way southwards. So that's done. That's on the river bank. <laughs> done by a master uh, story writer. Now, how the atmosphere, the mood, how it is created. You know, fantastic uh, craft. And the moment stretches and yeah, stretches yeah. and stretches. Yeah. And yeah. such a happy ending. Yeah. Without any yeah. anticipation Everyone of it. I, I, remember, I was translating. I was, uh, you see, terribly uh, upset rather the first time I was reading, you know, because I thought this boy was going to be bitten by There was so many recent tales of uh, children being uh, bitten by snakes and dying, you know. And this is a happy ending in any case. <laughs> Not yeah. for the dragonfly, but yes. <laughs> yeah, the dragonfly, the, the boy won't kill the dragonfly. You know? no. He will he will employ it, you know, in, in task <laughs> like lifting a stone, you know. This is the boy, the six-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. So? So, yeah, maybe, maybe we go back to those uh, questions uh, okay. that uh, uh, I'm supposed to ask you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the third question was, of course, this is a uh, this is a Malayalam story, right? Uh, yeah, this is a Malayalam story. Yes. Back, so, yeah. so the question is kind of uh, uh, related to this. The question uh, uh, is, what is India's present contribution to the world literature? Uh, how could uh, we do better? Uh, what, according to you, should be the subject uh, focus? Uh, uh, we as to us, we as writers. India's great economic change uh, and uh, inequality, the cultural change and disruption, the social uh, ills, the minority movement uh, or the political hegemony or something else. Mm -hmm. uh, what is going to be the great Indian novel in 2021? Mm -hmm. You have asked a very complex and long question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to put it back to you in a very simple way. <laughs> India's present contribution is tremendous, unique, quantitatively. Poetry, fiction, drama, screenwriting, literary criticism, essays, biography, autobiography, travel books, and children's writing from the 24 national languages, and a number of minority languages and mother tongues, including tribal languages, add up to a considerable percentage of the total of the world's 
literature output. How brilliant the works are depends on the worldview, perceptions, and execution of the individual author that we have discussed earlier. How could we do better? I do not know how to answer this question. It is not like improving one's work culture and productivity in the material sense. How to perceive better, how to visualize better, how to dream better, how to bring out a finished product, be it a poem, a story, a play, a screenplay, all this depends on the individual writer. There are, of course, creative writing courses to improve one's craft, but craft is only the outward form. How to breathe life into it, like in the case of the Old Testament God Yahweh, breathing life into the clay doll he had finished with his own hands and created the first man on earth, Adam. So that is the kind of thing. You create something, you but you have to breathe life into it. You know, that's then only it becomes a creative area. So how to improve? I think only by our own uh, mental culture, our own values, you know, our own uh, honesty to ourselves, our own commitments. These, these, these are the strong points of the Western uh, individual. So in that sense, you can emulate the West being in, in being honest, being truthful, being committed, being responsible, all that. So I'm not implying that we are not that, but we are in our, our own way. Our own way we are going. So you have to have your genius kind of thing brought out by giving your everything. You know, there's no halfway, there's no uh, uh, half measures in writing. The theme a writer chooses is entirely subjective. One cannot guide her or him in this. The only advocacy here could be for humanity. One can urge a writer to engage in affirmative kind of writing with empathy for the human condition. To set one's sights on the great ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity, to be on the side of the weak, the suffering, the ailing, and not to be part of the majoritarian chest thumping. These things we can, I think, uh, uh, exhort our writers to mind about. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So with that, because you uh, you you have uh, brought out the West and the West's uh, strength. So probably the next question is uh, close to that, is that yeah. uh, how much we are borrowing from the Western ideologies and craft when we tell, tell a story, write a poem and make our literary argument? Is there anything unique about us, Indian writers, very in very tangible terms? Is there any purely Indian literary movement presently that holds a lot of promise, promises? You know, again, a purely Indian literary movement, uh, you cannot think about, you know, it's all so much, you know, globalized, it's all meshed up, you know? all intertwined with, with Interculture kind of thing, and intertextuality is the technical word for that. You know, you now it's 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 a global village. You know, that's a kind of thing. Of course, we have emulated Western literary forms that we have from uh, the modern before pre-modern times. You know, from the Renaissance times, from uh, uh, early nineteenth century, we have been uh, uh, following the Western uh, forms like the novel, the short story the epic, uh, the lyric, you know, that kind of writing uh, we have been following. But we have, in that sense, we have our own traditions and we have been, I think, continuing that tradition even now. See, the kind of literature that developed here over a couple of millennia has had tremendous influence on our writers. For example, in most of our major national literature, there were Mahakavis, you know, the traditional Mahakavis following the Sanskrit tradition of a great poet writing in Mahakavya, or poetry of epic dimensions, and being presented the title of Mahakavi. So this is an entirely Indian kind of thing. It's not, in the West, you have a poet laureate, maybe in England. And uh, so that's another thing. That is a very political kind of, uh, the, the king's favorite poet. Yes. You know, that's the, but he's not here. Yeah, you write a Mahakavya, you become a Mahakavi. You know, that's yeah. the way it is. 
So we have had our great uh, literary greats like Kalidasa, Bhattuhiri, and several other great poets, dramatic institutions, and philosophers ranging from the Rishis and the Munis to begin with, of your to thinkers and logicians down the centuries. Our great culture and little or local cultures equally contribute to our literary output even now, although we have borrowed and adapted Western literary forms to suit our requirements. I don't think there is anything unique about Indian writers. Every writer in any corner of the globe will write immersed in one's own environment and culture. Writing reflects life. We too happen to write reflecting our own lives. So this is what I think. There's nothing special about Indian writing or Indian writer. All are cultural products. So you yourself live with a value system and that value system may be entirely different from the Western value system. So whatever you create uh, by way of a poem or a story is around your own value systems and the clash of the West maybe. You know, this kind of conflict you can uh, see like in the modern uh, living, uh, styles of living. Like for example, uh, uh, young people living together was not in vogue till, uh, say uh, for 30 years, but our uh, great uh, writer M.T. Vasudevan Nair. She is the one, I think he openly started living together in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. So there was one example like that. But now it is it is uh, kind of, that's the way, uh, you know, um. living together is a, so with the Western modes come to, uh, India or uh, the, the in some cases it's post-colonial, some cases it's not. Uh, kind of thing is there. That legacy is there. But now it is, uh, you know, the globalization going around. How uh, one culture, a particular culture, maybe the Scandinavian kind of writing, you know, like uh, Ibsen's plays. How Ibsen's plays. Uh, influenced uh, women's movements in uh, Kerala, I know. So th this is a, a kind of uh, very mixed fair, very hybrid kind of situation. You can't just claim something uh, special for the Indian uh, writer. So. Probably we have lost the host again. Oh, no. So we are taking this, we, we use this time just discussing. A little yeah, bit. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell me. So, okay. So, uh, uh, so probably uh, we go for the next question. Yes. Uh, this question is uh, the editor. Uh, uh, now, how a young amateur writer uh, should, uh, should try to make a larger copy? cultural and uh, literary impact uh, in India. And uh, do you have a preferred list of journals where she should be published? <laughs> As you know, print publishing by way of uh, newspapers, magazines, and journals on a national basis has been passing through a great crisis, even before the patch. Very true. Major newspapers, particularly those ones which had dedicated a number of pages to literature and culture, you, know, you remember DNA, you remember the Hindu, all these, you know, had cut down their space and uh, DNA wound up, you know, you know. New writers in our national languages were not that unlucky. So the national languages, uh, language uh, publishing uh, literature in, in Malayalam, for example, or uh, like that, you know, they could still find patronage in the print media, in the, la in the language press. But English publishing had definitely shrunk. As far as I know, Indian literature, which I had been editing for a long time, till I left it recently, is the only platform for writers in English, the print version. There are quite a few online platforms, like the recently launched the Beacon website, which I sent you, uh, of Ashoka Pankhyaya. Muse India, which has been there for a long time now, which published creative writing in English. So there are only two that I can remember. Publishing in Hindi is stronger and versatile. So is the case with Marathi, Gujarati, Bengali, Asmis, Malayalam, 
Kannada, Odia, Tamil, Telugu, Urdu, and the rest of the major Indian languages. All these I know personally because I have uh, uh, kind of friends, you know, who give me facts and figures about this place. Uh, literatures, you know, they are, um, uh, especially in, in, in all Indian languages I have, you know, the Diwali issue, like in Malayana we have Onam issue. So almost all important poets and story writers will find their place in the Diwali issues. Yes. So that kind of uh, publication is possible even then, you know, monthly, fortnightly, weekly, like the Mother of in Malayana. So it goes on like that. So that uh, kind of... Uh, writing in our national literatures and publishing in uh, periodicals and going on, but the English writing. That, yes. Though it is very prestigious and uh, so much of fanfare about it and so much of, uh, you know, astronomical kind of advances are paid to English. But the English poets and uh, ordinary kind of writers, not the star writers, they don't have a kind of space to publish. That is a kind of thing and uh, probably so 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 what do they do then i mean what what she does uh, this this amateur that, writer yeah. that, 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 that is what my, my next suggestion is coming <laughs> okay, oh, my next suggestion. Oh, okay okay sorry terribly sorry yeah so the, the, this is your question number six Okay, all right. Yeah, let's yeah. let's Leah, ask that question. Yeah. Uh, so, what are your suggestions, especially to this to our community, uh, uh, Pune Writers Group, uh, if uh, it wishes to encourage and support many writers, and uh, if it wishes to make significant artistic and cultural contributions? It's really <laughs> heartening to see that you have such an active and involved group. That's I'm really bold over. You know, you have so many interested, active, passionate, uh, involved uh, members. That's a plus for you. Congratulations to you for Thank that. You so much. Yeah. To begin with, I would request the group members to pool their resources and start a website in English, where aspiring writers can publish their works and earn a modest remuneration for their published work. Now, you should take care of this. Whatever intellectual contribution uh, anyone is making, make at least a token payment. Because yes, that's absolutely without without you know if you get something like that without payment you'll not appreciate it you know that's the way that, that's the way of the world if Very you get true. it for free you throw it away so that's the way Very true. so let there be a website in which uh, English uh, you know poetry stories literary commentary film review travelogue all these things you know life writing by so these things can all be, it can be a, maybe a hundred page website. Like that, you can begin. You have to appoint a competent editor who has absolute freedom to choose the right kind of material from among the submissions of the writers, edit and prepare it for publication. You have to have a very competent editor for that. You can set up a payment gateway and accept uh, uh, payment, you know, subscription. From the subscription, public. yeah. Yeah, payment gateway, you know, or online, uh, this thing you can have. And you may, can we can have maybe a board of directors or a trustees or a, uh, like patrons or something, whatever, you know, whatever management plan you have in that. You see, if all of you subscribe, there will be nearly 2,000 subscriptions. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, is <true. laughs> that is true. That is true. That is true. So I hope you can for, form a, a formal governing body and mobilize a seed fund mm -hmm. to run the journal on the lines of a business. Then only it will, it will whatever is there to run as a hobby without uh, the, the money involved, it won't work. Very if true. it has to work, it has to be professionally run. No amateur issue. No, that won't work. That's the thing. So this is the best you know, because you are so involved, uh, the members, and you have uh, put it in such an organized way. This is uh, the realization of this dream is only two steps away. You know, first you <laughs> form the fund, you get the the funding somehow, just to have a pool, you know, have a seed fund, and work from the uh, maybe the interest that it generates, and you can. You should be able to pay the uh, the the authors from the subscription, and the uh, and you can maybe decide not to accept any advertisement at all. Hmm. 
you can run it's 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 a it's a labor of love it's a non profit kind of thing of course, of course. so <laughs> otherwise there will be a lot of other things also so let it be a non profit but it will you know depending on uh, the kind of uh, um, uh, work that is published you know being a member doesn't ensure that you will be published at all. <laughs> you know that's another thing you know that is you have to leave to the discretion of the editor and if it is good enough it will, it will go on. So, you know there are, it, it it's a kind of collective which has a, a potential of uh, going on and on otherwise without any a uh, problem because uh, it's a uh, uh, joint custody which you will cherish you know i think so that, that is all i have to say this is uh, so the nice that, that, kind of uh, so that, I'm, i'm so happy to see you as a very compact group like this. you know this is very very heartening in these times to have at least a uh, 2000 people coming together for such a thing it's great oh we have wonderful people i mean some day you know if, yeah. if i can you know introduce you to all our organizers and all those who are yeah. really 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 active and holding it we we do many activities and it is not yeah. possible by one or five people there are a lot of people there contributing i mean they are contributing sometimes with money sometimes with time sometimes with contacts you know it's an amazing group i i must i must confess so this gives me courage or gives mm-hmm. us courage that in case we do it in case we publish a magazine may we invite you as one of depending the... on I, 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 i can i can right now come in because i have so many other things so yeah, many other things absolutely. but i'll be there with you i can fantastic. i can always be there in a, fantastic we, we we can think about many things in the future but uh, right now i have uh, so many other things to do you know that i have engaged in uh, but i can i can i can be of uh, whatever help you want from my side i'll you know, thank you so much thank that you is, so much. Uh, and uh, it it's going to be uh, we have a uh, no eight minutes left so what we're going to do is that we're going to take a photograph i mean mm-hmm. of all of all of us so okay yeah if, if may i request all sort of you to uh, uh, switch on your cameras so that we can have a group photo how you do that oh It's just to do, <laughs> we just just look at the camera and uh, sumit is there and uh, he yeah, will he'll he will do the rest we, okay. yeah he will yes yeah Shankar Sini, Pratamesh, uh, Lakshmi, if you can, and Mansi. Uh, Sini, your <laughs> <laughs> my careful face is not coming. I don't know why. Just cover your face. Just cover your face. That's fine. No, no, no not, yeah, not I... you. Not you, Lakshmi. Uh, I'm talking to Sini. <laughs> Yeah. Is it done, or should we say, or, or, should we, or, or should we say cheese or something? <laughs> I think Siri took care of being giving us. So now, now whatever time we have, uh, it is open to the audience. Please ask whatever comes to your mind. Now, the floor is completely yours. while you were out uh, in between i was just wondering that in india we learn about shakespeare in school we learn uh, when you're older you learn about haiku and haiku yeah. which cannot yeah. be actually translated to english properly no, i mean no, no. and yeah but i don't know about the indian forms of uh, uh, specific <laughs> indian uh, forms it, it, in all our languages Yeah, right. uh, I know definitely about uh, Malayalam, Kannada, Tamil, and uh, Telugu. See, all these are there uh, even before the advent of the Western forms. We have had our own meters, Dravidian meters, and uh, poetry being written that in the epic form and the lyric form. All that is there, and you can see, for example, the Tamil uh, um, uh, poems of love and war. You know, it's called the 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 sangha uh, sangam poetry yeah sangam poetry you know but a- 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 a
uh, poems of love and war uh, poems on uh, shiva speaking of shiva so these are uh, the uh, best example of what was going on in uh, our languages you know apart from sanskrit um, so we have a very accomplished kind of uh, uh, poetic forms or uh, literary forms uh, you know so we have something like a uh, a novel you know it, it's kadambari of banpata you know it, 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 this is even in many of the, uh, the the modern languages the novel is called kadambari you know <laughs> the novel form is called kadambari so, so we have such uh, our own uh, uh, literary forms there is no doubt about that uh, but should we go back only to that and stick there we have do we have to throw out all the western forms no there's absolutely no if you are putting on a t-shirt then you, and if you are putting on a pair of jeans then you have <laughs> entitled to uh, adopt uh, uh, a western form of uh, literature also i think so. because we we can we are not living in an isolated world so uh, there's absolutely only that you know to go back to our uh, own literary forms i think we have to uh, learn our mother tongues learn our literatures in our mother tongues so there should be uh, in the mad rush for example in kerala we had this uh, english medium you know english medium craze was there for the last 30 40 years now every, everyone is going back to the malayalam medium the government run common school so that's a great improvement all the tiny tots are now learning mother tongue and everything is there so whatever we have in over the last uh, 800 years we have a very rich kind of uh, literature in malayalam gradually developing with the ruthachan for example ruthachan is the bhakti poet of the 17th century 16th century century and we have had a uh, our bhakti poet like uh, uh, tukaram uh, namdev kind of uh, i think they are in the 16th 17th century so he in kerala the bhakti uh, movement was very late and confined to only one or two poets you know because the kerala uh, social structure is such that way but in all other languages also in uh, kannada you have the vachana poets from the 12th century fantastic poetry 21st century poetry you will feel if you read the uh, uh what's the poets translated uh, into again by ekaramanujan by h s prakash so many uh, vachana uh, translators are there you can, you won't believe it the kind of poetry that you read you it's, it's so uh, uh, up to date you don't have to even think of haiku or haiku is i w- i won't look down upon it but i would say that where people writing haikus in english or in our languages they're trying out a new form maybe but you don't have to go uh, you know about haikus and haibans you know there are specialists in haikus <laughs> these are not these are all fads i think i don't i don't i personally remember b- b- think that these are uh, very uh, not uh, kind of if you confine yourself for to to haiku writing and you call yourself a haiku expert or a specialist that uh, i don't know we have so much you know like uh, you know very parthrihari for example you know you look at his uh, uh, sanskrit poetry it it it's again 21st century you will not believe that it is of this uh, say uh, 1200 year old 200 year old you know you have uh, now gulsar has brought out uh, a poem a day I'll, i'll just show you just one second and in the chobna is published have you seen this book yes 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 yes, yes we yes. have yes great effort great project wonderful really Sri Gulsar has uh, translated poems from the early uh, second century uh, kind of you know onwards mm-hmm. present present uh, uh, 21st century poets included 
there are 366 poets of Brazilian. You'll see many of our ancient medieval uh, poets uh, translated by Gursar into uh, uh, Hindi, you know, Hindustani and English. Uh, fantastic, I, I, I can't say, you know, you, you, it's a journey through our literary forms, our own literary forms. So I think living with tradition, living with our own tradition, sharing the Western view, what I was talking about a little while ago about intertextuality. So that precisely is our sharing of the of the collective unconscious kind of thing that happens uh, automatically or even deliberately you uh, read a lot of western things a lot of eastern things like Japanese Chinese Korean yeah speaking about Korean you know you you see a lot of films for example nowadays many of our so-called great film directors are lifting you know stealing from from great Korean films. This is happening now. So we are not isolated. We are living in a world that we all share through modern means, of course. So speaking about our own and taking pride in only our own is a little passe. I don't think it is any more tenable. So I think being sensible, if you're watching a uh, a Japanese movie or a Korean movie or a, a, a French movie, if you're listening to Western music about classics or uh, the, the later uh, forms of uh, music, then you can also share uh, uh, Western hiking literature also. Why not? If you're eating Western fare, I'm sure that you must show all of you uh, tasted Thai dishes or <laughs> many. It, in that uh, sense, we, we are, you know, eating out means we are eating out, uh, trying uh, some other culture's uh, cuisine forms. Like you could do shawarma, you would take a, uh, uh, you know, a bite of shawarma. Shawarma is, uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, the, from Lebanon. <laughs> so it is like that. It's now inseparable. It's all you know, meshed up, you know, we like it or not, we are not living in isolation. So I think we have to uh, bother about this. Only that we have to maybe like uh, uh, Dr. Swati uh, pointed out, uh, I think we have to take care that our children also read our great epics, our literature, that also. They should not be confined only to the foreign ones. They should be given what is our Indian uh, or our own, you know, the national literature, for example. If I am talking about my child, I should first worry about the Malayalam that she reads. You know, that is the way it is. Uh, so I think this is just fine. And uh, I think uh, my friend uh, whom I have uh, talked to over telephone, Mr. P.V. Surendra Nath, is sitting here. I just want to say hello to him. Can you? Hello, 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 sir. Yeah, hello, yeah. hello. No, I was keeping so, up because I'm first time. Yeah, in... yeah. That's why so I... I, I. That that's fine. So I, 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 I'm just telling you. You know, they are after the changeover. There, uh, I've uh, recommended. You know, their thing. I, I think it should work. I, I think so. Definitely, definitely. I now come over to Delhi. I'm here in Delhi now. Yeah. You're in Delhi, but I am here. I, I'm not coming to Delhi <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, let this vaccine come. I'll take the vaccine. So because in March, in March, all these senior citizens are being uh, yeah, yeah. vaccinated here. So in after that, I waited there, but I think now it is too late for my professional aspirations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, Sachidanandan came over to Delhi in uh, in uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. July, August. And August. He, August. he wrote a small piece making controversy regarding Kerala. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but uh, again, you know, these are uh, very subjective kind of thing. I don't think Kerala is doing uh, uh, better than most of the uh, states that we know. Only that here we have a very open society. We have media, everything. Everything. Everyone knows everything. Not only subjective. Now I am told that they are manipulating data 
Maharashtra, I mean Bihar, they are manipulating data. Yeah. So that the data now being published is totally different from the actual. That data. I knew from the very beginning. I'm beginning with Delhi, UP, Bihar, mm -hmm. Gujarat, all that I knew. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is in any case, we are uh, now, I think many of our near and dear, my Manglis Dabral and uh, D. Vijay Mohan, these were all my personal friends, you know, uh, passed away like, you know, there are so many uh, from our own office, uh, yeah, my yeah. assistant editor passed away. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, we are passing through these times, you know, if you, right. if you Living to tell the tale is the kind of thing that we are going to if we live at all. Oh, I read Delhi. I'm confined my... <laughs> yeah. 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 Can't go about right. Anyway, this uh, session was very, very excellent session. Thank you. Okay. Keenly watching and observing. Mm -hmm. That's why he yeah. kept... No, I, I know. I saw your face. I saw your name. Yeah. Face I would not have made out, but the name I saw. Yeah. That's right. So... Thank you for making this thank opportunity. Thank 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 just, a, just a second, probably there is yeah. one or two questions. Uh, just yeah, yeah, in, if, if you, if you, you have no one problem. Problem. absolutely. So uh, no. recently I being brought up like I began yeah. reading what they advised in school. Yeah. And now it is only recently that I started reading translations of uh, yeah. Krishna Sopti, Benjamin, yeah. and presently I'm reading Mustache by S. Harish. Yeah. So uh, my uh, there's this conscious voice at the back of my head telling me that yeah. I'm not reading the original. Yeah. Even if the translator I know has done a brilliant job. Excellent. I, cannot, yeah. I know that this is a translation and I'm constantly scared that I'm missing out what the author wants yeah. to say. So uh, can you address that? How does one, what is the, is there a thing that you have to do while reading the translation? How do you make the most if you don't know uh, the language? Very difficult because uh, you remember Shank, uh, 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 Tagore when he won the uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, he was the craze of all our national kind of writers from Malayalam, G. Shankara Kurup, and uh, such people, and from uh, Gujarat, I forget the name of the gentleman. They all learned Bengali to read Tagore in original. So this kind of thing, no one, nowadays, I think uh, some people I know, some friends I know, have learned Spanish to read the Latin American writers, especially Marquez and Jorge's and all that, to, to read in original Spanish. So this kind of uh, uh, aficionados are there, but uh, uh, for the most part, you have to be content with the translation. There is no other way. How will you? How will you get into the genius of a language otherwise, unless you learn the language? So I think there is, you, you, you can feel uh, maybe uh, quite anxious and eager what the original would be, the flavors. But most of the translations, you know, now hopefully, you know, um, uh, 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 leaving the trace of the original in the translations to give a flavor, a taste of the culture. So if, if you Malayalam, you read Appam, Dosa, Mund, all, all that, you know, those, those things will be there. This is the way you know what it is. And Dosa, Appam, Italy and all, it's all available in Mumbai and Pune, you know that. So that way, you can connect uh, in parts to a great culture. You listen to the music, listen, you see the Kathakali performance, listen to the Chenda, and uh, you see the kind of... Uh, the traditional dress that the Malayalis say. So you get to know the Malayali culture by and by that. You know, not only through writing, through all these things. This kind of thing, the same, I think this is uh, equally um, true about our sharing of the Northern, Western, or Eastern Indian uh, uh, lifestyles uh, through cuisine, through dress, through music, through cinema, all that. So I, I think we, as we get the the, the, the chance, I think we always are open. We are to uh, our neighboring. Uh, though within India, we, we these are all different cultures, you know, very different. You can't say, say people used to say even very recently subcultures, but it's not subcultures, it's whole cultures. These are whole uh, cultures. If a Malayali culture is Malayali culture, it's not Malayali subculture, it's Malayali culture. 
Sub national, no, it's a Malayali nationality. I will always say that. So we are a, a union, uh, the Indian Union, of course. Our uh, national borders are there, our currency is there, our army is there, all those things are there. Yet we have our own different identities. <laughs> we have our own languages, we have our own. There's no idea of an overriding one single cultural line. So this is what Sahitya Academy has been propagating all these, you know, it's one Indian literature written in many literatures of India. So this is the way it is. And I think it's a very unique kind of thing. You know, you don't have the same thing in Europe, for example. In Europe, it's very similar in, uh, you know, when I was, uh, I visited Europe in uh, 1997. And that was the time when uh, a lot of Eastern European people were coming out to the West, you know, in search of jobs, you know. The Poles, the Czechs, all these people were coming, the Hungarians, the Romanians, they were all coming into uh, Berlin and Paris and London. And I could see, you know, it, the, the cultural difference is there very much. But it is, you know, they have a common uh, Christianity to fall back upon. Uh, there's a common culture. Uh, Christianity and Judaism, these were the two uh, uh, opposing kind of thing. You know the whole story, what, you know, culminating in Hitler's uh, uh, concentration camps. and uh, So th this is the kind of main uh, struggle. But before that, what was it? Nationality. This kind of national, intense national struggles gave rise to different European nations. But finally, we, we ended up in the European Union, you see? That kind of uh, churning of history, I think that uh, that kind or even more uh, kind of churning of history we have had in our subcontinent. But we have many things in common. We have many, uh, you know, what to say, uh, all, everything. We share a lot of things. Yeah, Yet the we are- Sanskrit thing, Sanskrit background. Yeah. Yet we are separate individuals in many other things. So it is a unity in diversity. This is the Sahitya Academy's uh, slogan that uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan has coined. Uh, he was the president of Sahitya Academy. So unity as Indians in our diversities. So this is exactly what it is. So that is the best message that we can have. <laughs> so uh, uh, is there any other question? Uh, it's not a question, but it's thank you, Vish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dr. Thomas, thank you so much. This is Raghav. Oh, Raghav, Raghav. Raghav. <laughs> so there. it yeah. was such a pleasure meeting, you know, you meeting you virtually and uh, meeting everyone else virtually. So it was the first time event for me and uh, learned yeah. so much and I'm feeling so much inspired to read more, write more. Thank you. Think, thank you, Raghav. And, and Are you writing, uh, writing steadily? Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> do that, do that, do that. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Keep in touch with them if they are, if Arun is starting a website. Absolutely. <laughs> Arun will for sure. No, Raga <laughs> writes, uh, excellent, Raga writes excellent poetry. So I've, uh, I've just, published him, just published him in the uh, September, October issue. So I know. Thank you so much. So, so Raghav, but tomorrow is we have a session uh, at okay. 12 o'clock. That's oh, a kind of a feedback session. So okay. here we read our pieces and get feedback from wow. each other. So if you'd like to same a link. Absolutely. Just can join us, can join Absolutely. us, you know, every Thank Sunday, you. every Sunday. Definitely. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, is it confined to members only? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Please join. It no, is, I'm, it is a, yeah. I'm confused as asking openly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. It is a community of writers. So we, we wish to help writers because we lack resources right now. So maybe very tangibly, we cannot like scholarship or something, but uh, other ways, whatever way we can help with our time and with our whatever small money we contribute to the cause, we do that. And Dr. Thomas' uh, suggestion is very, very valid. And absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. We are going to do something about it, very sure, <laughs> yes. A anyone else? We have if, lots of guests today, so yes, yes. Please invite them. <laughs> for yes, all yes, please, yes, please, please come to come to come to our sessions. Our sessions are on Monday, uh, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, Saturday session is this at this time, three o'clock, 
uh, Monday session in the evening, 7.45, and uh, Sunday session is at 12 noon. Join any of them, don't worry about anything. Free all the time, going to be free as long as possible. And uh, help us or take help from us, no problem at all. Connect with us on Meetup. I put yeah. the Meetup link in the chat. So yeah. you'll get uh, notified every time. When updates are posted on Meetup and Facebook. So if you follow even our Facebook page, uh, you will come to know of all the activities we do and the Meetup page. So at the end, uh, please, uh, uh, because we cannot do anything else, express our gratitude. Uh, Mr. Thomas, give us two minutes. Uh, Kinjal is here. Okay, uh, on behalf of, I, I know I speak on behalf of everyone that we are immensely grateful and count ourselves very blessed to uh, have AJ Thomas uh, serve with us today. Uh, what these two hours have done is, they have expanded time, expanded our minds. Uh, it has been immensely, immensely inspiring to have you with us. Uh, yeah, so it has been an overwhelming experience thank for you. us. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much. And uh, I, I want to thank you because it's a very lively group. It's not, you know, I don't even feel that it is a virtual kind of thing. You know, I'm actually meeting you, you individually. That kind of feeling I'm getting very warm, very involved, very passionate kind of people around. And I thank Arun for, uh, I don't know how you found me out. How, how did you me? <laughs> <laughs> and all the other organizers. You know, who, yes, yes, who it, is, it, is not, it is not in one person's job. It is, it is, yeah. I mean, I can tell you at least, to, I mean, broadly 20 to 25 people are continuously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, it's very good. We are very lucky, you very keep lucky. Keep yourself, you know, that you can do a lot of things. You know, this is what yes. I'm feeling. All, not only, uh, 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 you know, not only the web sign, you can also, I think in my suggestion, you know, if there are people involved in uh, music, in uh, uh, dance, kind of, you know, such groups from this big group, you can form and you can, you know, full-time kind of uh, uh, activity. Uh, like, you know, again, it's not hobby, you know, it, it's a no, part it's of the line that's a hobby. Affair, you know, so that is a very Creative only through uh, visualization, vision, dreaming, creation, we can survive the present kind of situation. Is that it? So I think it will be very worthwhile and it's a very unique kind of group that I've seen. Very, and I would thank just you. like thank to end my gratitude note with a request that please let your guiding hand be with us. Yeah, <laughs> I'm always available. You know, just uh, watch some message away. You know? so there's absolutely no missing uh, Whatever I can do in whatever form, I'll be. Happy to help you, depending on my time kind of thing. You know, so we'll be in touch. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir.